morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, so my name is Mick Moran. Uh, I'm Irish, and I'm here. I want to make it very clear that I'm here representing, uh, or at least with my UCD hat, my University College Dublin hat on, rather than my law enforcement hat, which is uh, on Garda Síochána, which is the national police here in Ireland. And uh, they haven't approved me to be here, so uh, in that sense. So I'm, I'm not representing them. Um, I presented to first 11 years ago in Vienna. And I'm looking forward to the next time because that will give me an opportunity to use my Irish accent to get a laugh because the next time will be the third time. So I'm looking forward to that. My partner in crime today is, uh, will introduce himself. So I'm Omar Martel. I'm doing instant response and uh, digital forensics, but net hunting and threat himself for the last 18 years with quite a few people in the audience today. So thank you for being here. And uh, I'm looking forward to this discussion and presentation with Mick. OK, so started. this, yeah, it's a sensitive subject. We're talking about child exploitation. We may mention things like penises and vaginas during the conversation. So it's important that you understand that before we start. If you find anything here today, or if you feel there's a risk of you being triggered, then feel free to leave. Nobody thinks anything different uh, of you. Uh, in, in, the, in the event of that. If you need any, if you do find yourself triggered, one in four .ie is a very good uh, organization here who will find you help in your own country or will give you some instant help here. If, on the other hand, you are somebody who finds that you think about children in ways that perhaps you shouldn't, you'll get some help at the unfortunately named pedo.help, which is a website which offers self-help to people who are concerned about their thoughts in relation to children. Uh, and certainly, it's a, it's a very welcome prevention uh, initiative. So we're really here to talk to you about this uh, insider attack that you have never heard of. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, again, because the subject matter is sensitive, feel free, please, to pop your questions in here, all right? We won't be saving any IP addresses. We won't be anything like that, but it, it, it's a way for you to put in an anonymous question if you feel uncomfortable about speaking about this subject matter before, the, uh, before your peers. So feel free to uh, ask any questions. So because it's such a deep and meaningful uh, issue, we decided to open with a little bit of Carl Jung. And basically, Jung makes the point about the fact that you cannot be fully enlightened unless you face the darkness. And it's a metaphor that I use often when talking about child sexual abuse within our communities, is that if you shine a light on darkness, there's nothing left but light. And so I thank you all for being here today because it is a subject matter that is sensitive, it's difficult, and because it's in the difficult drawer, often the drawer is opened and immediately closed again. And point we, one of the points we want to make to you here today is that, look, Yes, it's subject is a difficult subject matter, uh, but if you understand it a little bit better, then perhaps you'll have less of a problem dealing with it, especially on, your, on whatever services or platforms that you're putting in place in the world. So uh, I'm going to start, Roman's going to continue, and then we're going to finish together. So I wanted to talk to you very quickly about the different crime types that exist in an online child sexual exploitation and abuse environment. Grooming where, where uh, an adult puts a strategy in place that, that, that results in abuse of the child. Live streaming of child sexual abuse to order. This is something that people who work in financial services will probably see uh, a little bit. Uh, for relatively small sums of money, uh, people in poorer regions of the world are encouraged by people from the West to abuse their children to order live on camera. This is getting bigger. We're seeing it like that from a policing perspective, and we have been seeing it since 2007, 2006, 2007, but now in the last, and especially during COVID, it shot straight up. The, the graph just went like that. Um, online sexual coercion and extortion, otherwise known as sextortion, where a child is encouraged to share an image that perhaps they wouldn't share with their grandmother, and then from there, that's used as a threat, platform jumping across, it's used as a threat to extract even more and more uh, sexualized content from the child that generally results and peaks off in stuff like 
the child abusing a sibling for the, 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 the blackmailer, or uh, indeed where they can't deal with it anymore, it often results in the child self-harming. Uh, and we often hear then the worst cases we always see in the press are the ones that involve uh, suicide, of course. Um, I'm just going to play this small video for you before we start. So we're going to concentrate on CSAM here, child sexual abuse material. Sometimes it's called child pornography, but at the end of the day, it is a documented, uh, a documented, a documentary, if you like, of the abuse of a child. Sometimes the abuse is recorded, sometimes it's uploaded to the internet, sometimes it's sold, sometimes it's swapped. But the point is that it's out there. And sometimes it's called child pornography. But, you know, it's the people who like it the most who like to call it pornography. The Copine scale is very handy because I don't want to put images of child sexual abuse up here on the screen. But you can imagine it. And so the Copine scale gives it to you in text. And was it, was it Oscar Wilde who said that sometimes the thoughts of death are worse than death itself? It actually might be better to actually see the images or the movies than to actually read about them here. These ones, the Copine scale is 10, is 10 steps, 10 levels. One, two, and three are not illegal. Four and five are not illegal. Four and five are not illegal. But what they are, and what's very important to remember, is that they are often an indication of a sexual interest in children. So even though it mightn't be illegal, it may be that they are uh, these, these ones here, for example, we, we tend to call child sexual exploitation material, where the child is dressed in a sexual manner is definitely and clearly being sexualized. The, from 6 to 10 are the illegal ones. Generally speaking, the EU directive and things like that, generally speaking, concentration on the anal or genital region of the child or the child engaged in witnessing a sex act or involved in the sex act, generally speaking, is illegal. Where a description of it is written in text, it is generally also illegal. And where images might be deep fakes or might be pseudo images, they are also illegal, generally speaking, from 6 to 10. 9 and 10, if you read number 10a there, pictures showing a child being tied, bound, beaten, whipped, or otherwise subjected to anything that implies pain. Unfortunately, we see an awful lot of that. When we talk about, I don't know, is the water, is it the water blocking the, the signal? I think you, you were there. Okay, but, so. Hang on, hang on. I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is an instant response uh, keynote, and, and we know there are horrible things on the internet, right? But it, it's, it's quite rare, isn't it? Yeah, uh, very rare indeed. In fact, it's so rare that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children got 29.3 million reports of child sexual abuse material or related to it last year, 
last year. All right? It's that rare. Okay? And this is the National Center for Missing Exploited Children in the United States of America who get these cyber tips from companies based in the United States of America who are complying with law that says that they must report incidents of this on their systems. So 29.3 million. These are examples of what you can find coming in from those companies. Most of them uh, are online companies who who are providing the services and platforms that we are very familiar with, Facebooks, the Googles, the Twitters, the TikToks of the world. But the idea that it's a rare thing, I don't know where it's coming from, because this is what our graph is looking like, and this is what it is, has been looking like for the last, or since I last presented 11 years ago to you. This is what it's looking like. All right, more and more and more and more. Uh, sorry, I get it. it. It's inappropriate and there is a lot of it, but everybody here, I mean, I've seen, you know, this 16-year-old Lolita uh, girl, uh, 16 looking 20, looking at the sea, dreaming of the future, right? I mean, yeah, dreaming of her future lovers, you know, fully developed, ready to launch herself onto the world. Yeah. But if I ask you here today to answer this question for me, how many of them had images of children on their tree? Roman, would you like to make a guess? I don't know. Uh, but you know, because well, you're behind the curtain, so you know. I Anyone mean, out there like to make a guess? 20? Yeah, that's. And indeed. OK. Uh, well, these are babies. Facts. Yeah. It's rough, all right? But if I told you that 80% of the material that's out there is prepubescent. Does that get closer to your image of your girl out on the beach dreaming of future mm, lovers? Yeah, well, th these are babies, right? This is, this is yeah. horrible. <laughs> yeah, but you see, Roma, what's very important to remember is that the anal rape of a three-year-old, while it's terrible, it's no better or no worse than the anal rape of a nine-year-old. Yeah, come on. Uh, no, that's well, what well, you're dealing with, but that's what we're dealing with here. Why are you telling me this? I mean, this is a computer <laughs> security conference. I mean, we're not dealing with society issues, right? Because it's this found is not my job. everywhere. Because if you put a platform online, if you put a service online, it is going to be abused by people who are involved in this area. It's absolutely your business. It's absolutely got to do with what you do every day. All right? It's not about illegal. It's not about... It's just... Either there's safety by design, which is going to take consideration of this, or either it's a threat to your network. End of story. A threat to your services. It's a threat to your, to your beautiful rack system. The threat within that you haven't seen coming. All right? And where is it hosted? Well, on the web, 83% of it is hosted in the West. All right? That was, we could talk about that all day. But 83% of the web traffic related to CSAM is hosted in the West. Okay, so, so who can be downloading these sort of things, right? Anybody. Anybody can be downloading it, Roma. Anybody. Okay. All right? Including geniuses that work for you. Well, I guess, I guess there is always a small number of bad apples in the world, right? Of course. And I mean, how many people would you say in the world have sexual interest in children? Anyone want to make a guess? Really? Yeah. Come on. This is the only choices we have? Yeah. There's no, there's no point involved because all of the academic studies that have been done, of them all, none of them are below 2%. And again, all of these are done in the West. So we haven't started in the Gulf. We haven't started in Asia. We haven't started yet. So 2% of Westerners, I don't know how many people are living 2%? in the room. 2%? Yeah. How many people do we have in the room today? Wow. <laughs> you want to put your hands up? All right. We'll stop, we'll stop poking them. So why do they collect CSAM, right? Many, many different reasons, sometimes for profit. But often it's a needs-driven activity, all right? It's sexual. It's for arousal purposes. It's for masturbation. I'm always challenged to get that word into every talk I do. It's, it's sometimes for community, because within these chat rooms and websites where 
People gather around this issue. People feel very important. Those who are actually abusing children right now and who are posting new material all the time, they are the king in rooms like this because they are the ones who are in a position to ensure that it's, there's new stock coming online all the time. And when I say new stock of files, I am talking about new sessions of abuse against these children. Two good examples of what we're dealing with at both extremes. This is a former colleague of mine. Clearly, he wasn't a dentist. He's a former member of Angarda Shiakana, a police officer who pleaded guilty to possession of CSAM. He got involved in a conversation with an undercover police officer that resulted in him chatting about sexual matters with a 13-year-old girl, in inverted commas. He pleaded guilty. Another example, at the other end of the scale, uh, just giving away the answer to the question, the next question. God damn it. That's right. Funny. Another example at the other end of the scale is this guy, Peter Scully, an Australian guy, fled Australia to the Philippines, put on a, 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 a website called NLF, or No Limits Fun. He produced the Daisy's Destruction series. And I know it sounds cliched, but definitely the worst shit I have ever seen in my life. Level 10 and beyond, a level 10 plus. So much level 10 that of the three girls that he abused together along with his girlfriend and then live streamed for profit, for payment on his website, no, level, no, no limits fun. Of the three girls, only two of them were ever found alive. The third one was found buried in his basement. Whether or not he produced a snuff video we don't know. It's very unlikely that he didn't. He was at that level. So, hang on, hang on. So, the guy is selling this on his website? So, that means he had to have like a VPS hosting payment platform, you know, only online storage that you can imagine, maybe a CDN or something. And who, tell me, Roma, is controlling all of this CDN, yeah, I get, payment I get services, your point. platforms? And here's another point. Here's another point. As you will demonstrate later on, both of these geniuses could have been working for you. Ah, oh, come on. Could have been working within no. your security I mean, team. Who would be stupid could enough? Could have been working in your organizations. Who would be stupid enough to do these sort of things from, from work, right? Oh, no. So, I know I already gave you the answer, so I'll give it to you straight away. All right? This is a fact, and I think... I can say it because I'm law enforcement and I've heard it here and I've heard it there and I've heard it from companies who are selling products that will solve this problem for you. Have you? What do you think of this number, Roma? Well, I'm thinking about the number of employees in my organizations and I'm doing math now. Yeah. And w Would you not? All right. That's a podcast that I highly recommend you listen to called Hunting Warhead. I highly recommend you listen to it. It'll give you a very, very, very good uh, rundown on this. So, when we talk about victims, we have to realize that behind every child sexual abuse issue, there are victims, and none of these children exist in real life. Again, I said I wasn't going to display anything. I wouldn't do it to them, to the kids, because they've been abused already. To show their faces here would be a further abuse. This is from a website, notarealperson.com or something like that, all right? But it's a nice analogy, a nice metaphor, because see the way some of the kids are hidden behind others? Well, that's because of maybe where they're located in the world, or where, what race they are, or what, um, whether their law enforcement are working on this issue or not in their country. They get hidden behind other victims. Boys often get hidden behind girls. Uh, younger, uh, older kids often get hidden behind younger kids. These are all issues and metaphors and issues that we need to deal with with this. And one of the ways that it gets hidden, oftentimes, because one of the biggest, best pieces of work that law enforcement do with victims of child sexual abuse material is they do what's known as victim identification where through the examination of the material that's found online or during searches or whatever, 
they, they trace the kids, they find the kids, and by finding the kids, they will often, and in most cases, find the abuser as well, because the vast majority of child sexual abuse takes place within the family home or in the immediate family circle. Realities again. And so these kids are often hidden, and one of the ways that these kids get hidden and forgotten is because people from your constituency find material on their systems and delete it because that's the easiest thing to do. And when they delete it, they perhaps have deleted the only chance that this child has of stopping abuse that started when they were three years of age and continues until adulthood. That's your constituency. That's why this matters to you. That's why it matters. That's why we're here today. I'm about to throw this out into the... Too far away. And victims of child sexual abuse have a high degree of dysfunction later in life. Difficulties in becoming re relevant people in society. These are the words of victims that you see here. I didn't make these up. These are victims themselves, named victims. Ones who get online every day and search for their own abuse pictures 20 years after it happened because in their minds they can never be at rest, they can never move on, they can never get closure, because they're dealing constantly with the threat that someone will recognize them in the street. And I could tell you some horror stories, I just don't have time, of people who have been recognized in the street, or of who have gone public for some reason. Uh, maybe that they made a presentation at their work or whatever. And then the comments section is, oh, I remember you when you were much younger. Oh boy, you don't look so pretty without a cock in your mouth. These are the sort of comments that goes on under the pictures of this person getting presented, graduating from university, graduating from high school. This is Jürgen Stock, an old boss of mine, BKA, now Secretary General of Interpol, and this is what he said. And I have been saying it, and I said it 11 years ago in Vienna to you. We can't do this on our own. Law enforcement can't do this on their own. This is monstrous. It's huge. The volumes are enormous. We don't have access behind your curtain. We don't know what's happening on your services. We don't know what's happening on your platforms. Privacy, GDPR, uh, 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 legal um, uh, restraints mean that we can't see, and rightly so, and rightly so. But unless you're interested in doing something about it, then nothing will be done about it on your side of the fence. Nothing. If you open that drawer, and it's the difficult drawer, and you open it, and you see something, and you make it go away, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I'll show you why. So now we're moving on to part two. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm an instant response uh, person at the core. So I'll, I'll share two use cases of um, uh, incidents that involve CISAM. I was never really hunting uh, for CISAM. So it's just uh, things that happened uh, and the lessons I've learned the very hard way. So case number one is how to turn your organization into the number one CISAM provider in the world. Um, so these are real cases I've been uh, investigated, uh, investigating, sorry, um, which are not necessarily my own organization, but they are part of the research and education uh, sector uh, in which I'm uh, having uh, my main work. So it all started with a letter from the police. As usual, you know, one of your IP addresses was associated with serious CISAM, received the letter. Um, and it was 18 months ago, you have to deal with it. Mick, 18 months ago? I mean, we do forensics, we don't do, you know, archaeology, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so when this happened, this is like a, a human operational forensic nightmare for a secu security team. Like, it's a serious case, and it was 18 months ago. So, well, it's serious enough that uh, we start, um, you know, in-depth internal investigations. Good news, we have a nice inventory, so we could find the computer that was involved. Um, it was a retire, but it still existed, so we just walk in the person's office and say, look, we're looking for this laptop, can we have it please? And he's like, sure, here's my old laptop, uh, is yours, it's yours? Investigate, so it's like, okay, uh, let's have a look at this. 
But before we do so, the legal department comes and says, no, 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 you don't touch that laptop. You know, CISAM, law enforcement, you just give the laptop, the name of the owner of the laptop to the police, they deal with it. But you know, I'm, I'm an investigator. Um, so I want to investigate and you know, confirm the facts. So we look into it uh, without touching any of the CISAM part, and it's very clear, it's a clear cut case. You should have been disciplined for ignoring the legal department. Maybe. Everyone knows the lawyer. Oh, especially right. because the laptop, you know, contains all of the evidence. Um, the police was right. Um, there was all sorts of horrible content uh, that we can find. But I kept digging because I really like to hunt these kind of things uh, to the very end to be really, really sure. And very late at one night, I found a very strange entry in one log file, in one of the Windows events log file. And it really showed that there was more to the story. And basically, I will spare you the details because I don't have time, but it led to weeks and weeks of forensics works and in internal investigation. And what we uncovered um, is that we had a, a former disgruntled employee. That person was fired after stealing significant amounts of hardware, printers, servers, laptops, what have you, and he was selling it. Um, it included the MacBook Pro of the former sysadmin of the team. And so, uh, what the person did, the employee did, is that uh, he hacked his way back in, uh, IJIT accounts, host, and he spent months stalking, exploring, creating VMs, creating accounts, moving around. And really, finally, he gained access to the computer of his former boss for revenge. And the guy was technically really, really good. So what he did, when he had access to the computer of his boss, he started an email client in the background and started sharing and downloading huge amounts of CVM. We got very lucky on this one, in a way, because the email client spontaneously crashed after 30 days. So we didn't have like 18 months of this. Um, but we spent a lot of time doing forensics and we could reconstruct what this um, email uh, client looked like. So Lots and lots of files. Um, you can't read it, and that's pretty okay because the name of the files are really, really um, intense. Well, you see P PTHC, that's short code for preteen hardcore. And if you look up above it there, 10 year old boy gets. I'd say it's gets. Yeah. You can do the best to rest yourself. So, what did we do? Well, the first thing is that this in depth investigation saved the former boss, I mean, the owner of the laptop. So, can you imagine? The consequences, if it given the name of this person to the police, I mean, the personal and professional impact if it had been accused, right? I mean, you can't go back to work. I mean, they all, you know, people say there is, uh, if there is smoke, huh? So um, that was really a good thing we investigated. Um, also, uh, the disgruntled employee moved to a foreign country, and the police told us that an international case was unlikely to succeed. And as far as we know, there was no legal follow-up. Thank you, Mick. As far as I'm aware, or if you asked me to make a comment on this, I would say police believes international case unlikely to seed, succeed is code for laziness. Yeah, we were certainly weren't lazy uh, with this no, case. No, I'm not, not suggesting you're being lazy, but I am suggesting yep. the police are being lazy. So anyway, continuing back, what was found in the house. So uh, we were all in shock, and we realized that on this laptop, there were about 769 files sharing very hardcore content, and we were totally unprepared for that. So uh, about half of the team uh, involved in the investigation could not even look at the fine names, right? We had to take precautions to not expose people to actual fine names. The classification was uh, class 10 for most of it, so the most severe content. But this was not the worst part, right? So as I said, I work in uh, research and education, which means large networks. So this means that this organization was in voluntary complicity of sharing for the 30 days 1.6 terabytes of severe CSAM. So this means that they shared accommodated requests for more than 164,000 users downloading this material. And so for, the 13, for 30 days, this was probably the top CISAM provider in the world. I let that sink in. This is... What you have to realize is how, how knowledgeable this person was and how serious it was because he uploaded peer-to-peer service to run in the background. Every time it's down, uh, something is downloaded from peer-to-peer, -peer, it's available for upload by somebody. No, the other way around. Yeah, every time he downloads, it's now advertised 
and available yeah. via the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network uh, for download by others. So if you work in a security team, this is probably the worst day of your career when it happens. And this didn't happen to like a small uh, security team run by PhD students. This is a mature security team. They have a top-notch security operation center, real-time detection of attacks. They use Intel, they use MISP, and other tools from hundreds of partners. They defend against APT nation states, and you know, we were off the shelf cybercrime every day. So they're really experienced, but they didn't see any of this coming. And can you imagine had he listened to the legal department, handed this over to the police, and they're too lazy to do an international job. Can you imagine how lazy they wouldn't have been to find an anomaly in a log file? See, that's your department. That's your department. So anyway, they did not see any of this coming. And the reason is that they never considered this type of threats, right? They focused on all the things. Like what? Well, like, you know, all the shell cybercrime, botnets and spam and things, but... Not this. Not this. So now I'm gonna move to case number two, is do you prefer your CISAM on-prem or in the cloud? Um, so this is a real case that I investigated with uh, actually two people in the room today. So thank, um, thank you to, to both of them. Um, and I had to choose, change a few names and location, but this is a real uh, case. So as usual, it starts with the police and an email from the police to a supercomputing center in Academia again uh, in Italy. And they said that this computer center had to uh, follow orders from the court and they include a long list of many hundreds of video files and timestamps that was uploaded from that academic supercomputing center um, online. And it included many horrific expletive file names, all classified of the worst in the scale. So there are different scales of a classification, but from what Nick showed you, this is the worst category. Uh, the flow of the report was very clean, in fact. Uh, it was uh, flagged by Google, then uh, shared to NECMIC. Uh, As I told you earlier on, those cyber tips, so the company shares it to Google, shares it to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who share it to US law enforcement. They, they've since been taken out of the loop, so they'll go straight to the Italian police now, so that, that those two steps where US law enforcement send it to their uh, liaison officers in, in country, that's gone. So no. now it's just neck neck directly the to police the police did a pretty good job on this one, I must say, so well done. Yeah. Uh, wasn't so easy on our side because <laughs> we couldn't figure out whose problem it was. I mean, this um, IP address in the computer center, nobody had a clue what it was supposed to be doing and who was running it, right? Uh, that's a big problem. And the reason is that this, is, uh, this physical host in the data center is allocated to a large European computing project, uh, which is operating on... Um, hundreds of such computer centers in Europe, even in Asia and South America and other places. If you want to, no. So you have to start peeling the, the, the onion. <laughs> Don't touch the computer. Move away from the computer. <laughs> so um, this, what they did is that this uh, European computer project, they allocated some resources to a marketplace called the Federated Cloud Infrastructure, uh, which, um, uh, well, and one of the many users of this federated cloud infrastructure is an earth and science EU project. And it continues to be dig deeper, and they use this for their own uh, distributed global virtual infrastructure. And in, as part of this uh, virtual global uh, infrastructure, they have all this, I minimize this badly, but, and, and what you can see here then if inside, they even have a catalog for applications to be running. So you have to go even deeper, right? So that has to be pretty complicated, huh? uh, if you want to start uh, assigning blame. Um, so they have a marketplace for researchers to deploy and develop their own applications, and ultimately they rely on a private um, partner uh, that is um, flagging itself as streamlined DevOps multi-cloud platform as a service based on container technology. Now let me tell you, the vast majority of my colleagues, and I'm not dissing them here, but the vast majority of my colleagues, not those in specialist units, but the vast majority of law enforcement officers in the world Understand the word streamlined. After that, it's... Well, Mick, I have no idea what this means. This is marketing. Yeah, but I know. <laughs> but, uh, but if you've no idea, no, what no hope idea. have I? No. What hope have I? What yeah, I can what? tell you is that if you look at the sort of diagram which we try to build for that, um, the attacker uh, attacked an app running on top of a distributed platform, which itself is operating on containers, 
right? Which itself is running on a distributed virtual infrastructure over 30 countries. I understand, I understand. Um, then it's physically host hosted in hundreds of data centers, right? Hundreds, hundreds. okay, hundreds. And ultimately, you end up with an IP address in an Italian oh, super IP center. address, I understand IP address. Yeah, so yeah, if I yeah. have the IP address, I, I have the guy. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, you know, these Italians, they own the hardware, and they are the legal entity responsible. No denial there, but they have no knowledge, expertise, or even control over the actual platform that was abused, but, right? But we have the IP address. Yeah. So if you have an IP address, then you do forensics. <laughs> I have a surprise. Doing forensics in such an environment is a nightmare, right? And the reasons are very simple. I mean, you have to work simultaneously with cold recovery VM snapshots. You have live databases uh, that are never uh, constantly changing, uh, which contains online catalogs. We have many layers of very complex software. Um, you know, different countries and organizations in, involved at each of these layers, different people, different jurisdictions, and highly heterogeneous amounts of log files, right? So if you do forensics, well, good luck with that. Be easy for the police. Yeah. So it took some time, and the, poli the police and court slightly became impatient. No. And um, there was a slow plot twist. So they decided, okay, the Italian supercomputing centers, they can't do anything, maybe. So we're going to name personally the head of operations of this European computing project uh, as a person in charge and, and responsible. So they bubble up. Um, they move from the black square to the gray square on top. And this really put the pressure on this European project to get things sorted. Uh, in particular, because there was a second plot twist, which is exactly at the time um, uh, NECMEC said that uh, this infrastructure uploaded CSAM, this streamlined DevOps multi-cloud platform service based on container technology actor reported that um, they noticed uh, that uh, on this platform an unusual traffic uh, increase uh, on the platform. They reported it to the scientists uh, in charge and jointly they decided to delete and respond the involved virtual machine and delete uh, two suspicious user accounts uh, that they found on the platform exactly at the same time the CISAM was And then they reported it. Or did they report it before well, they deleted or did they, no. no. Well, at what no. point did they tell you? No, they never told us. Uh, so they didn't follow any of the several instance response procedures had in place or contacted anybody. They just deleted it under the carpet, end of story. Which was pretty bad. So we had to really work with this uh, streamlined DevOps, blah, 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 actor, because this is really where most of the action happened. And initially they helped us, they were pretty nice, and then they, they understood that it was CISAM, the police was involved, so they went quite silent, and we were really worried they would lawyer up. <laughs> um, so eventually uh, uh, we called the CEO and said, well, this is really serious, you have to help us. And they agreed to uh, charge us $500 for two Zoom calls in which they could help us and teach us how to use the intricacies of their complex systems. Uh, they couldn't share any logs or data um, regarding the unusual traffic or deleted VMs, which was all gone. And um, the log files, local log files, or even the ones in the databases, or even all, well, rotated uh, or deleted prior to forensics. So after you paid the $500, then they helped you to find mm. the problem? No, no, not really, no. Um, so after a lot of time uh, doing forensics, three months of work, we could only find two email addresses and two IP addresses from the attacker. And the basic forensics reports is basically uh, empty. So uh, what we suspected is that there is circumstantial evidence that it was likely a professionally operated, paid for service to download CSAM. And using this um, academic environment, you had super good bandwidth and a very, very good amount of storage. So, but anyway, hey, we never heard back from law enforcement. No, you, right? didn't, you didn't hear back from law, law enforcement because the amount of hoops that law enforcement then have to jump through in order to have the weird email addresses checked are enormous. For example, an MLAT will take anything, an, a, a multi, I don't know, MLAT. Uh, what does MLAT stand for? Multilateral. Multilateral. Assistance. Assistance. Uh, are you treaty. a real policeman? Yeah. Okay. MLAT's just the bane of my life, so I kind of ignore them. But an MLAT can take anything from six to 18 months. They are, in fact, a 19th century solution to a 21st century problem. Well, the NEM that I was involved in was between uh, Germany and Sweden. It was very easy. Uh, it took only a year to officially translate the document between Germany and, and Sweden. And between, between the European Union countries, it's quite quick, and there are other instruments now available. But once you start to move outside the European Union... So, anyway, so these are just two simple examples of 
lessons learned the hard way. Uh, but there are things you can do. And so in, in this last part, um, we're going to you know, expose a bit more how you can uh, deal with this. Because even if you're not hunting for CISM, CISM will find you, as we saw, because of the volume and the amount of flow employees doing it and the general issue. Do, before you do this, do you want to put up the QR code for the? I don't have it here, but uh, people are free. OK. You know, free, free Otherwise, you can add the question after that. Yeah. And oh, we'll, the we'll, we'll leave some time for questions yeah. uh, at the mics as well. So, Mick, can you, what can you tell us about that? Well, look. What can you say about 18 month stuff? You know, if it has gone from Google to NECMEC to the DHS to DHS in Italy and it's gone from you know, 18 months. 18 months is actually nice and short when it comes to an MLAT. There is zero excuse for 18 months in relation to that. But the headline on this slide is collaboration. It's working together. Having a relationship with your local law enforcement. Reaching out over the fence. Talking to them. You know that if the police had the skills that you have, they wouldn't be working for a functionary's salary. All right? If they had the skills you have, they'd be working for you, OK? So we absolutely need you. And in order to do what's right, you absolutely need us. And working together, we can make a difference. We can make a huge difference. Explaining this stuff, multi, what is it called? Oh, Multi-platform multi yeah. thingy, yeah. Yeah, explaining yeah. this to a jury, and believe me, I have explained this to a jury, is very like, I'd imagine, the experience you have in explaining a cybersecurity incident in the C-suite. All right? You certainly can't talk about, you can't use sales blurb there. You have to use black and white. OK, so the first thing I highly recommend everybody in this room to do is to start treating CISAM as a form of cybercrime, right? And the way that it is just like for any other type of uh, crime. You get indicators of compromise, you put them in your security infrastructure, SOC, or whatever you call it. The cost would be virtually zero uh, compared to the volume of data you would get for your uh, average APT. Um, there is some um, caveats that we have to be careful with in terms of jurisdiction, uh, because the police is not very coordinated in some places, and so you have to have some care with jurisdiction. If you get indicators from a country, they may not apply to yours, etc. But besides these basic caveats, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Indicators are something you're always, sorry, you're all familiar with. Uh, there will be binary hashes, or MD5 or SHA-1. Uh, you can um, test for um, you know, downloads or storage. Um, you know, URL, URLs you can also uh, put in your system. Fuzzy hashes, uh, they are really, really important in this case, although they can lead to false positive, but they can give you a clue uh, of what's going on. And keyword lists as well, uh, which are maintained uh, in some jurisdictions. Uh, most indicators come uh, with a severity or classifications. Uh, and the bottom line here is that you don't have to look at CISAM. This is what it's changing. Having indicators means you don't have to look at the pictures. You can just use automated classification, rely on law enforcement, and you don't have to look at it. So don't be afraid. These are just malicious uh, files, and you can treat them as, as so. The second aspect I would like to highlight is to always investigate. Don't block, always investigate. There is a, a tip of the iceberg effect um, uh, where you can have an exponential impact when you investigate because most perpetrators are collector or regular uh, abusers. So I, I have a small anecdote from uh, Imgur. So when they joined Thor, uh, they had the hashes, they put them in our system, and within 20 minutes, they detected on Imgur uh, a known CISAM hash that was being uploaded. So they reported it appropriately, but they did not stop there. They looked at the account, they did forensics, they investigated, and they discovered more, uh, several hundred more pieces of CISAM that had never been seen before. And then these new hashes, besides sharing his law enforcement to identify the victims, could be shared in the community, investigated, and content be taken down. So this really means that this strategy allows for an exponential impact uh, when you investigate. You will discover more, you share it, and then you discover more, so that there is no way perpetrators can share online uh, images uh, without any consequences. You also have to consider insider attacks and sabotage. This is pretty common that there are employees 
uh, involved in downloading um, CSAM, right? Yeah, and I mean, I, I could give one whole hour on the offenders themselves and how they get involved in this business and how they end up and what they will do. And you would be surprised, the one in 500 number also in, involves people using your devices, uh, uh, downloading at home and viewing at work where they're not in a position to, 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 to do that at home. Uh, when they're on the road, people, companies, and some of them are in this room who have endpoint, uh, who have CSAM, they treat it seriously within their organization. They have it in the AUP. They make it clear that it will be reported to law enforcement if there's anything of that nature found. That sort of, sort of policy decisions made within the company, and then they have endpoint protection that will spot it. And you'd be surprised how many people have USB keys that they plug into the devices that you're giving them. Probably the USB key that you gave them as well uh, to do it. And, and always reporting it to ensure that it's added to the, the database is, is absolutely essential because that's a, a virtuous circle. Uh, there are efforts being made by the EU, for example, to they will have a national center. The national center in, in the United States, they have hash sets that they share through the tech coalition with the, with the online platforms. So there's all sorts of initiatives and stuff out there, and we can talk a little bit about that later. But, there, but you can do your bit. You can absolutely do your bit. Deleting it is the worst thing you can do. I've already made that point, and I banged the table when I said it. It's absolutely the worst thing you can do, because once you feed it into the law enforcement environment, or even the NGO environment more and more, then victim identification will be carried out. And if that, there are clues in those images that help, then that child will be located. And if that child is located, the abuser is located, and the whole thing stops. So you're actually, again, remember, sexual abuse doesn't take place just once. It often continues throughout childhood, over many, many years. And you know that the average time of disclosure, what, another quiz for you, Roman. What's the average time of disclosure for someone who's sexually abused as a child? How many years would you say it takes them to disclose that they were abused? How many years would you say? I don't know. How long can you hold the secret? Yeah. The average is somewhere between 25 and 30 years before people disclose that they were sexually abused as children. Well, still, I think we can, we can go on a, on a deal, right? Yeah. We can do um, investigation, we can do detection, we can do monitoring, we can do forensics, we know how to do this as a security team. But you look at the content, you do the classification, and I'm not good at dealing with people, so if you could deal with the victims and the perpetrators, I'll, I'll be very grateful. Yep, and, and, then, this, and, this, and, this, is, and this is the, the, the Faustian pact that we can put in place, because we are used to dealing with this. We are used to dealing with it, and by creating a hash or some form of signature, and hopefully we get more AI classifiers and we get a standard in place so that there's AI will allow this to happen, uh, or will assist in finding, blocking, reporting it. Uh, you know, the, the, it means that you can, you can see it and you know it's on, on a list. You don't have to look at it. You don't have to decide where it fits on the copine scale. And there are consultancies and there are people out there who can assist you with that anyway in the future. But, um, one of the questions we actually have here is, uh, why don't the security vendors put these hash values in their things? And do you know an answer to that question? I think some do. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're working uh, with somebody who wouldn't be here today, you know, one of the security vendors, and they do check for it. Yeah. Um, but it's really difficult for them to act on it. So th they need more collaboration with law enforcement to leverage the data they get out. Because yeah. one thing is important, I mean, reporting CISAM found is important, but reporting access to CISAM is super hard. And I'll give you a final case I've been involving, involving quite recently. Um, so imagine you are doing instant response um, that is involving some CISAM case, so you have to be careful. Um, the laptop involved uh, really, really uh, is downloading CISAM. You identify the suspect, but there is a caveat bring your own device or device that you don't own, right? I, I guess you've been already dealing with that, right? A bring your own device that is compromised. Well, this time, the device is allowing CISAM, is owned by one person, but this person is an IT contractor not working for the organization, and so the laptop is not, so, not owned by the organization. So the main suspect doesn't work for you, and the laptop um, isn't yours. What do you do now? You have evidence that your crime committed. What do you do now? I mean, if you want to accuse the person, you have to look at the laptop. You have to get the evidence out, uh, hand it over to the police, but you have no jurisdiction. You can't even look at the laptop, right? 
So it's, it's, it's a difficult position to be in. So in that case, what we did is, uh, after long discussions, we um, looked um, at this with our legal department. We decided to suspend the access of this person from the organization. Um, we contacted the contractor and said, you know, this is a laptop that is being, belonging to you. It's being used by one person, this person, and this is the data that we saw related to the laptop. This is what's been happening. So the contractor phoned back immediately and says, well, I'm really sorry. I mean, I'm gonna take care of this. This guy, you will never hear from him again. Um, is fired right now, and I'm gonna send somebody new tomorrow. Um, you know, okay, that's the deal. Um, but he didn't uh, report the case to enforcement. And the suspect there, uh, of course, he lost his IT job, uh, but he found another job. Um, and the job he found was to be a caretaker uh, for young children at the local hospital for mentally handicapped children, right? How did I know that? Well, it turns out that this person physically abused five children starting at 30 months old for two years before he was arrested. And the case was very, very public. The, the person was arrested and the press said this person was a former employee of that IT organization. He was browsing CISAM from work, thousands of images, and was fired because of browsing of CISAM. Threat. Right. These people are needs driven. They will not stop. If that had been reported properly, there's a chance they'd have stopped. They certainly wouldn't have got a job in a hospital for mentally. Yeah, so uh, always report. And I have a big fail here, um, and now I have to live with this because I had the data. And I, I, could I could give you, we were running out of time, so I could give you 10 examples of this, including, including the police having, uh, having files uh, in a drawer that would have allowed them to carry out a search at the house of a pediatrician. And during the period of time that that file sat on the desk and the time that they finally did the job, that pediatrician had abused nearly 40 children under the age of 10 in his workplace. There's lots of things like that. So we'll have a, a, about 10 minutes for questions, I think, but uh, just as a quick summary. Uh, no, I think the time is, is here. Huh? So summary, if you want, like, uh, the bottom line of all this, if you are operating a CSER or running in a security team, you have to have internal procedures specific to CISAM uh, for computer security instance response, uh, for the human resources, and for uh, your legal or uh, jury, um, well, legal team. Have a strategy that is ensuring presumption of innocence, preservation of data, um, and that you can handle law enforcement possible cases. Always investigate hits. Always report both hits and CISAM to the appropriate location. Even if you don't have enough evidence for a court case, most likely there is sufficient ground for dismissal of the employee involved or sanctions. Also, a golden rule, never expose staff to non CISAM. There are many good ways to avoid uh, looking at it for classifications. Second point, as we mentioned, get IOCs. Put them in MIST for whatever you have. Detect, block this kind of content, right? The cost should be zero. This is such an important issue, and in terms of security operation, the cost for you should be zero. So. No sound? We can do to defend ourselves alone. We need each of you to act. So thank you very much. If you would like more um, information or contact points, you can flash code this or go to this URL. And we have a few minutes for, for questions now. So let's take them from the floor first, and then we'll do a few off the, off the machine. Thank you, and apologies. I didn't scan the QR code quick enough. Andrew Cormack, JISC. Um, more than 20 years ago, I worked with the UK Home Office and law enforcement to get a provision in UK law that allowed sysadmins to take forensic backups in these circumstances and not be seen as immediately committing a crime. The big concern was that any kind of it was said loophole, would be used by abusers. So how do you go and establish contact with the police 
in a way that says, no, I really am a good guy. I am not an abuser pretending to be a good guy. Um, so what, you know, how, how do you actually go to the police and say, look, I need to work with you as a collaborator, not as a suspect? Do you want to take it? Yeah, I, I, I don't mind. I mean, from you, what about from your side of the defense? I, I know from my side of the defense. So from our sides, uh, really, life was much easier when we started building informal cooperation with law enforcement for any type of crime. Uh, and then we could introduce CISAM as well, and they were very helpful. So now, anytime I, I encounter, sorry, encounter some suspicious material, I don't look at it. I go to the local police office, I meet the guys, and say, well, can you tell me, is this illegal in this jurisdiction? And they can t tell me yes or no. And having a, having a relationship with your local law enforcement is a very good idea. Uh, and okay, you could be the one in 500 uh, person, of course you could, but acting in good faith will never be seen in a negative way by either law enforcement or the courts. Yeah. Never. I, I wish. Yeah. Um, and sorry, and the other update, Mick, you said nothing, things below five are not illegal. That's very jurisdiction specific. Oh, I in, agree. In the UK, I, uh, most of the I, way I, down I may have said there. the word generally before I said <laughs> so not don't, legal. But don't, anybody in yeah. the audience, don't rely on that. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> please. Uh, I, I totally yeah. agree with you. Yeah. But what, what happens is there is so much content out there between six and ten that we tend not to ignore f one to five, mm -hmm. but we use it as indicative rather than illegal. That's the yeah, point I, I was. Uh, okay, so it's generally not illegal. But, but regardless of jurisdiction, whenever I contacted law enforcement because of the case, they were always very supportive. Sometimes busy, and it was still frustrating because of length of you know, court cases and everything, but always supportive. And a key point is one to five is an indication of a sexual interest in children that you yep. don't want in your business. Yep. Go ahead. Good morning. First of all, thank you for the presentation. I think it's important that we uh, raise and continue to raise the flag and the alarm within the cybersecurity. Um, I don't really have a question for you specifically, but I have a question for the audience here. Um, how many of you are ISC squared, CISSP, or other certified or credentialed people? Raise your hands. Okay. I'm just going to simply remember, remind you that as a CISSP, we have a canon and code of ethics, the safety and welfare of society, and a common good duty to principles and to each other. Those are our principles that we live by as a CISSP or ISC squared. Protecting, being involved, making sure that your infrastructure is not being used for CSAM or other exploitation is, as far as I'm concerned with regards to that code of canon, is part of our job holding that certification. So we have a moral and ethical obligation to be out there working with law enforcement and doing proper incident response. Point number two I just want to quickly ask is, when it comes to a work environment, as you talked earlier, Roland, about the uh, contractor that was coming in, would it not be appropriate for, in your legal terms, to engage that contract, uh, a contractor organization to have in your terms and conditions that if you, your organization detects some sort of CSAM, that you will take action directly and that that's part of your hiring requirements for that contractor? Maybe that's something we need to figure out what that legal language needs to be and get the legal beagles to put that into the agreements. And I would say the same for acceptable user policies for your staff. Exactly. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. You're perfectly right, indeed. Okay, I'm just going to take one off the phone. Uh, so, owning CSAM on your device is considered illegal. How does a task force team collect evidences of this crime? So you mean, how do you make sure that the, the, the evidence you collect can be used in court, right? Yeah, well, my argument is that you need to be thinking forensically from, yeah. the, from the second you are aware. Yeah, so this is like any other type of crime when law enforcement is involved. You do your best, and usually, um, you know, the judge uh, isn't stupid, and it works. But I can tell you in 30 seconds another anecdote I had. Um, so uh, there was uh, one day we had a report from one of the CISAM indicator, and it's um, apparently a young welder that's coming very early in the office every day and downloading CISAM. So spend you the details, but spare the details, but we uh, have an operation with law enforcement. They have to come in the office of the person, and when the laptop is unlocked, they will just arrest him and take the hard drive and do the investigation. Classic. Um, but um, the thing that happened is that police comes, uh, I'm here in the room pointing to the right device for certification, 
And I'm like, I really hope that uh, the logs are there, not rotated, everything is there. And the policeman, you know, tells the suspect, sit in front of the computer now. And I'm like, what? What are you doing? I mean, it's going to change uh, my timestamps and my file system and don't. I said, well, open your web browser. And I'm like, oh, history, don't, don't, don't do that. Maybe he has a secret uh, shortcut and will delete all the sesame. Or he's going to, you know, destroy the computer or something. What are you doing, man? I mean, the police, you should, you should know. And the suspect is like a bit dazzled by all the police and 10 people in his office suddenly and he's typing his URL and say, I go to this website now and log in. And the guy's like, oh, all right. And he's logging to the website. I'm like, hey, what are you doing? I mean, now my tensions are gone. I mean, that, you know, what am I going to do now? And the suspect is like, uh, yeah, okay. And the policeman says, have you been to this website before? Well, I don't know, maybe for testing or so log in. And he's logging in and he's saying, well, where are you, where are you going when you're going on this website? And he's well, usually clicking, go click there. And he's pushing the suspect. And I'm like, okay, he's destroying this case. What an idiot. But within five minutes, he managed to push a suspect in a position where he admitted that he went on his website. He logged in. He had access to the profile that was suspect, suspected. He, the personal details was perfectly matching. He knew about everything, and he admitted. So he had a court legal representative in the room, and he had basically a confession live from the suspect. That's the police officer, that's his job. Yeah. You don't and worry I, about his job. Yeah. You, you, you worry about your job, and your job is to keep it forensically sound so, until he gets there. So the hard drive was like a nice plan B, but. The guy here in front, called, his name is Ted, right? Yeah. He's responsible for talks, because yeah. his name is Ted. Yep. Yeah. All right? Talk, yeah. and, and he says we've got five minutes left, but okay. that was about a minute ago. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the sobering presentation. Um, as a, an investigator, um, you said, well, always investigate, but you also said, uh, don't expose your staff. And yeah, I know I don't want to expose my staff, but now how do I make sure that they will not inadvertently be exposed because they will be investigating and there's, a, there's also unknown CSAM. So w what do I do with these guys when I get them completely traumatized because they investigated a case? So whenever you're involved in a case looking at pictures, you know, even for simply for privacy reasons, usually people don't look, or when you investigate, you don't look at the pictures. If you suspect this is a CSAM case, in particular, you don't want to look at the pictures. So you have to be very careful. There are tools you can use to not display pictures, like you can configure a web browser to not display pictures, and just work based on hashes and file system timestamps. The thing you might be exposed to uh, is file names, and that can be traumatizing as well, and so you have to be prepared. Uh, but images and, and videos, if you're prepared in advance this type of cases, you can really have an environment where the whole team can feel safe. Okay. I've never seen CISAM, ever. Guys, we're going to run out of time, so I would ask you Thank please you. to scan this, put your question, and here's the reason I'm asking you to put questions now, because we will go from here, we're going to take all these questions and we'll put them and answer them on the website csam-org, csam hyphen, no stop, hyphen csam.org, yeah. all right, we're working together on that website and we'll take all your questions and we'll answer them there. Okay, and you'll see a drop down menu and you'll see our answers to the best of our abilities. Let's take one last question from over here. Community. Uh, I have one question. You mentioned uh, CSAM last indicators uh, and using those in security products. Um, do you have a set of resources that you could share? Uh, where yes. Yeah. Okay, All great. online. Great. Time is running out, but I have two last uh, data points to give you. The first one is that tonight we're going to run a workshop where uh, attendees will be put in the shoot, uh, shoes for your investigators. This afternoon, a, not yeah. tonight. Tonight we'll be drinking pints of dirty black Guinness. Time zones. Uh, where people will be put in the shoes of investigators facing um, a severe system case. And this is ways to teach people how to uh, react to that. And the last information is, remember, one system material uploaded per second. One hertz, right? So you, we all better act on that. Can you articulate a little bit more on the apparent contradictory need of the victim to have the copies of their recorded abuse deleted and LEOs need to keep their records for forensics, blah, 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 blah. That's your business, forensics. Keep it forensically sound until you hand it over to law enforcement. In relation to it, if you find it, take it down. Don't make it available to the public and please report it. For God's sake, do not delete. Delete. Do not delete. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Well done, Roma.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this, this interesting talk. Um, last housekeeping notes. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the app already, please download the app uh, and rate the, the talks that you heard and, and will hear. Um, there is a QR code on the back of your badge, uh, which bring you to the, to the app. Um, today, um, the sponsors will start showing um, all their booth and all their, their stuff. Um, so visit them. And last but not least, um, Today is one of those side events that I mentioned earlier, which is the, the soccer game. It's, it's an unofficial event, but it's, it's really fun. Um, it's indoor. Um, it will start, the bus will start at 9.30. Um, there is a maximum capacity of 53 people in the buses. The lists are at the registration desk, so make sure to put in your, your name there. Uh, first come, first serve. And enjoy your first day. Thank you very much.